Welcome all to my talk on the meta crisis of the meta crisis. A talk I gave originally at the STOA, which is run by Peter Limberger and Raven Connolly and others, who granted me the stage there again, which I'm very grateful for. I will also leave a link to the video upload of the talk, the original talk there, and um, has the benefit of me answering questions that are quite relevant. But I wanted to record this again because I uh, this is a bit of a, a, a version of the talk that um, takes into account some of the questions. And But this is not yet the final word because I'm trying to find what the fundamental crisis is of modernity. I would even be as blunt and say that modernity itself is crisis um, and that this is ultimately articulated by all of the great modern thinkers and yes yeah, so the meta crisis of the meta crisis started uh, as a bit of a choke in fact um, because i saw that the discourse around the meta crisis would definitely i thought lead to a meta crisis of its own and it would run into unresolvable contradictions which it tried to get away from but i think the response should be to appreciate contradictions so here is the talk the meta crisis of the meta crisis perhaps it is useful to begin with the meaning and origin of the word crisis and what its concept signifies for us today if we begin to take seriously that apparently something announces itself in the ubiquity of crisis. Perhaps it would even be fair to claim that crisis and its specific dimension is today that which addresses us most urgently. And assuming this is indeed the case, the question then becomes whence this utmost urgent crisis. The word crisis is, of course, of ancient Greek origin. The Greek krisis means separation dichotomy, conflict, strife, but also selection and decision. Hippocrates speaks of krisis also as pertaining to disease. The word krisis then here means the moment when the fate of the patient is decided, either for recovery or for death. In tragedy, krisis is the singular incision when the hero's destiny becomes apparent. According to the Brothers Grimm Dictionary, which is a dictionary of the German language, Goethe writes somewhere the following. In German, Alle Übergänge sind Krisen und ist eine Krise nicht eine Krankheit. In English, all transitions are crisis and is a crisis not a disease. We could then translate, or maybe cross over, as I like to think, from the shore of the Greeks to ours. Ferry across the river of the eons the word krisis as follows, by bringing all its meanings together. And not just have one meaning, but in one sentence, perhaps, its manifoldness, which is the following. The within itself turning of self-conflicting strife, things to which, however, selection and transition transpire as necessary, such that the path entered upon becomes irreversibly one's own. And here we are in the tragic as well and in the medical. This entering upon a path, however, is the instance in which crisis disappears. A crisis appears, it seems, when a transition is paving its way for itself and another grounding needs to be prepared. This seems to be coming from behind, barely seen, rather than looming on the horizon. It is in the paving for itself, the path that indicates this and that also requires, once the crisis is brought into focus, a decision. The word decision, of course, pleases the modern ear. For making decisions, as the English vernacular says, indicates that something can indeed be done. Control 
can be executed. The crisis can enhance, should be managed to minimize damage, insert suffering and maximize utility and efficiency. And still, despite the will to make decisions and to control, there are crisis over crisis. There is the climate crisis, the corona crisis, the financial, economic, social, political, institutional, socio-economic, intersubjective crisis. There is a housing crisis, a homelessness crisis, a public health crisis, a mental health crisis, a currency crisis, the euro crisis, a banking crisis, crisis upon crisis, diseases upon diseases with Goethe. Yet, is anything ever truly decided? Bearing in mind that to decide means to cut off from Latin cadere, to cut, to cut off and to let the incision occur. It may well be that all those crises are not at all there to be solved. In fact, there is no decision to be found at all. Instead, those crises are what the all-willing subject clings to, as this pun crisis is now what gives the subject absolute self-certainty. As long as everything is in utter crisis, I can and must and will manage the pan crisis. I, says the modern subject, I can even engage in abstract meta games of crisis that are entirely detached from anything and purely in the realm of constructivism, hence entirely without the suffering experience of the painful cut which comes necessarily with any disease and any transition. It is as though it is th it is as though high from the balcony view, some stand comfortably overlooking the world, pressed into the procrustus bed of models and representations, a blueprint of the meta crisis which, so the assumption goes, only needs all the right conditions met a priori for the so-called meta-crisis and meaning crisis to be easily and comfortably overcome or solved. Just take the ingredients of some rationality and causality. Don't forget the spiritual, though. And here is your entertaining, epidermally interesting, neatly defined set of solutions abstractly applicable to the meta-crisis. The historicized sterility with which thinking is approached indicates that something has broken off and away, that philosophy is no longer in charge of what it has always been in charge of, the grounding and founding of world access. Alas, what is seemingly becoming ever clearer is that modernity itself is crisis. Such is the grand claim of this humble essay. The attempts to solve problems in the cold and distanced way proposed to solve even thinking itself once and for all indicate a misunderstanding of the task and mandate of thinking. Thinking does not require solving or correct solutions. Thinking needs to be thought. How is one to make sense of this pesky, continental way of putting things? How is one to make sense of the grandiose remark that all modernity is crisis? The epoch, which gives itself the name modernity, which is to say, of the present moment, begins with Descartes. This is not intended to give a precise date or year, but to indicate, in fact, a transition, perhaps an incision, which we now call Descartes. Hegel says on the meaning of Descartes the following in his philosophy, in his history of philosophy. Quote from Hegel, It is only now with Descartes that we properly arrive at the philosophy of the new world. After a long time adding across the sea, Hegel continues, it is with Descartes that philosophy finally begins to see land again. For it, was, it is with Descartes, says Hegel, that philosophy begins to appreciate the importance 
of consciousness, Bewusstsein for truth. Descartes' doubts and Kant's contributions are what have given birth to the modern world more than anything. The oft-cited so-called Cartesian paradigm has become the unquestioned all-popular boogeyman, which can be pulled out, the magician said, at any moment a conversation requires a quick and easy deus ex machina to find someone or something to blame. Nothing of what is being said here intends to blame anyone, however. I don't intend to blame anyone, no. In fact, The unquestioned, repeated talk of the Cartesian paradigm is thoughtless because it neglects the necessity of the thought of Descartes and what he responded to. Why is it that the soul becomes the res cogitans, which in turn becomes the ground for philosophy? Why is it that casting doubt methodologically, that is, the negation of all certainty, in order to arrive at absolute certainty, is necessary? Why is it that mental perception begins to take the upper hand? How is it that the human being becomes the subject, the ground of objectivity, circling around and within itself, but at the same time establishing not only self-certainty, but also certainty over the objective world? And this is now the most important question, I think. Why had it become necessary to establish this certainty? Over the objective world, which is not just one of control, but also secures that which philosophy has always assumed, the unity of being and thought. It is only when this unity breaks away that the subject is truly trapped within itself. Perhaps what Descartes responded to with his methodical doubt is what we can call the pandemonic crisis that is modernity, namely the split between the unity of being and thought. Perhaps this had already announced itself to him. Perhaps already an utter withdrawal here had shown itself. The a priori, the a priori, which Descartes finds in the res cogitans, in the thinking thing, the things of itself, the thing that thinks of itself without negating itself, but negates everything else, should itself instill this quiet and unease with us. Still, Descartes is an exercise of freedom, for his thinking attempts to begin anew, casts doubt on everything and takes a distinct stands in the midst of beings. There's a tremendous philosophical autonomy in Descartes, thanks to its negativity, thanks to the negativity of his thinking. Yet it wants this skeptical negativity, for it neglects the negativity of the subject, sets in motion the self-positing of the subject. This freedom, though, should be taken seriously and also should be honored, while bearing in mind that there here Also, the isolation of the human being qua subject sets in, insofar as everything is doubted and negated, but not the self. The self is not doubted and negated. The self is transformed into a thinking thing, a substance of of sorts. The being of this thinking knows no negativity. Still, the audacity to cast doubt on everything, to negate the existence of all that is, and still to say, I think... I am is an exercise and testimony of tremendous human freedom and as such is at the heart of what modernity is. At the same time, the self-referential ego, as is cogitans, becomes the grounded ground, the foundation in which the human being finds a stance. This foundation, as we can see now, neglects the world and depicts a reification of the self, a self which is now isolated. With Descartes, there is an onset. There is also a necessity to it insofar as thinking always begins when it removes itself from the tradition and dogma. At the same time, thinking must, however, also take into care and heed tradition, or rather, that which is being delivered over for that in which has been 
the eternal strength of the onset sways. The distinct negativity of modernity is hence one which doubts and denies what came before and at once forgets the negativity of being. The neglected negativity of modernity transpires as critique for the sake of critique or with Nietzsche as the spirit of ressentiment. Nietzsche's Zarathustra says not only the reason of millennia but also its madness is breaking out within us. It is dangerous to be an heir. What I have elsewhere referred to as the apocalypse of the subject seems to be just this. The total exhaustion of the will to eradicate negativity, which forgets its own annihilating force, pushing against its utmost limit and simultaneously the slow realization that the withdrawal cannot be stopped, all the while dancing along liminal digital virtual edges established by the plethora of historicized files of meaning particles to which the late modern subject clings, if only for a split second, for the subject is trying to arrive back at the certainty of the unity between being and thought. And this unity, however, finally collapsed with Hume's radical skepticism. Hume awakens calm from his dogmatic slumbers, not least because of the former's own fundamental dogmatism. The dogmatism of which Kant speaks is the presupposed unity of being and thought, a presupposition which now needs to be cashed in. The critical project of Kant is to bring to the fore this foundational presupposition which thought had dogmatically assumed for itself. Kant does so not in order to tear down the metaphysical presupposition, but to place it on firm grounds, that's the Copernican turn, so that the unity of being and thought can be saved. The transcendental deduction, hence, does not deduce anything, but wants to justify the usage of the categories and the concepts of the subject. Kant is an Aufklärer, an Enlightenment philosopher, precisely because he clarifies, clears up, discloses this fundamental presupposition and at once sees the perfect ethical duty to himself and humanity to establish again a possibility for the human being to access the world after this split. Establishing how we access and approach the world has always been the mandate of philosophy. Even if contemporary academia has forgotten that and only looks at the so-called history of philosophy as some alienated distant object. Even though Kant clarifies for us that thinking must necessarily make this presupposition, which is an a priori synthetic judgment for Kant, in order to get back out into the world, that is, in order to establish the unity of being and thought again, where thought, however, is now understood as a representation and a Vorstellung, the objectivity of objects is now predicated on the subjectivity of the subject, that is, on its categories. No object without subject, no subject without object. With Kant, what we have access to then are representations of appearances, but not things as they are in themselves. Things as they are in themselves are pushed into the nameless realm, the noumenon, the noumenal, that which has no name. That's what noumenal means. The uh, It was Salomon uh, Maimon, who's uh, to be thanked here, for bringing to the fore that we can, through understanding the appearances, understand what things are in themselves. For him, the idea is two-sided. The idea of uh, the regulative idea um, of of uh, of cognition is two-sided, um, and but Maimon ends up in a skeptical position too because he neglects negativity, and when you neglect negativity, you end up in a skeptical position, which which doubts the existence of the external world. Um, but it was to Maimon, to which Fichte and then Schelling and ultimately Hegel uh, responded. And now, so, but with Kant, 
Again, what we have access to are just appearances, really, representations of appearances. Again, Kant still needs to establish the unity of being and thought once more. This is what he's doing here. Or else the specter of skepticism and nihilism which comes through with human others would begin to take hold and the human being would find no stands and no access to the world. Subjectivism would reign. At the same time, Kant in his attempt to secure this access to the world and the unity of being and thought, at the same time, Kant establishes the neatly the nearly, sorry, fictitious, fictitious, phenomenal world. That is to say, now with Kant, all we seem to have access to is representations of appearances, ultimately an illusion. The crisis then, and, 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 and objects here are constructed without contradiction. That's exactly what the sciences do. And this is exactly also what I, what I see happening in the meta, in the discourses around the meta crisis. That it's, it's trying to solve the problems a priori, abstractly, in terms of a formal logic. So it tries to construct a world without contradiction, and hence runs into all kinds of contradictions. Now, the crisis then that the first critique by Kant brings to the fore, which is this fundamental crisis, is on is on the multiple level. On multiple levels, it, it brings this to the fore, and that's the genuine meta crisis of modernity, namely the sudden disappearance or collapse of the unity of being and thought about which modernity enlightens us in the first place. And through this enlightenment, the various attempts to establish some unity again, almost to heal the dichotomy between human being and the world, the establishment of an illusory field of perception is the result with Kant. Even though he tries to get back into this unity, he leaves us with an illusion. Fichte, Schelling, Hegel, Maimon before him, um, Husserl, certainly Paul Natorp, and certainly Heidegger, are all names that speak of attempts to struggle against subjectivism or to overcome it. To say this again, thanks to Kant and Hume, we see the dogmatism of traditional metaphysics. Yet at once, what is, thanks to this disclosure, this aufklärung, this enlightening, this enlightenment, at once, at the same time, what's torn open here, a terrible wound is inflicted, one could say, so what's being torn open here is also the bursting away of the human from an access to the genuine world, to things as they are in themselves. We are cut off from being. It is crucial to point out that it is with Kant and only with his transcendental logic that the natural sciences find justification for their constructions of objects without inherent contradictions. This is the earthquake we name Kant. The attempt, though, must not be to solve abstractly and a priori this profound crisis, i.e. the split between of, of being and thought, but to think it through this crisis to its end in order to let its own overturning occur. Kant's project is not an arbitrary one. I quote here from the first two paragraphs of the preface of the A edition of the first critique. Human reason has the peculiar fate in one species of its cognitions, this is all Kant, that it is burdened with questions which it cannot dismiss. Burdened with questions which it cannot dismiss, since they are given to it as problems by the nature of reason itself, but which it also cannot answer, since they transcend every capacity of human reason. Reason falls into this perplexity through no fault of its own. It's almost like reading Heidegger. Human beings are addressed by something and they have to correspond. Sie müssen entsprechen. Kant continues, it begins from principles whose use is unavoidable in the course of experience and at the same time, because without the unity of being and thought, you end up like Hume. I don't know if the sun will shine tomorrow, rise tomorrow. I don't know. 
It's very comfortable to say this, perhaps, but uh, it, it's not just ironic to say this. It, it's, it's, there is a split that it sounds so benign, um, but any experience is predicated on the assumption that there must be some unity between being and thought. All the sciences are predicated on this. Now, again, reason falls into this perplexity through no fault of its own. It begins from principles whose use is unavoidable in the course of experience and at the same time sufficiently warranted by it. With these principles, it rises, as its, na as its nature also requires, ever higher to more remote conditions. But since it becomes aware in this way that its business must always remain incomplete because the questions never cease, reason sees itself necessitated to take refuge in principles that overstep all possible use and experience and yet seem so unsuspicious that even ordinary common sense agrees with them. But it thereby falls into obscurity and contradictions, from which it can indeed surmise that it must somewhere be proceeding on the ground of hidden errors. But it cannot discover them, for the principles on which it is proceeding, since they surpass the bounds of all experience, no longer recognize any touchstone of experience. The battlefield of these endless controversies is called metaphysics. The battlefield of metaphysics. We are addressed by something, and hence we are to respond. This is no longer Kant now. Again, not by solving in a calculative manner the problems at hand, but by thinking through what is at stake whether and how being and thinking can still belong together this is what's at stake whether and how being and thinking can still belong together so that this utmost crisis becomes the following the within itself turning of self-conflicting strife thanks to which selection and decision transpire and become necessary, such that the path entered upon irreversibly becomes our own. We must find our path out and through this fundamental crisis of the collapse of the unity of being and thought. Heidegger Hens speaks of the belonging together of being and thought. Conclusion. The metacrisis of the metacrisis, the discourse surrounding it, could then be summarized as follows. The sudden insight into the groundlessness of the attempts to solve abstractly and a priori all presently available concrete problems, constructing a world without contradictions, the dead formal logic of the various problem-solving attempts, attempt to construct attempts to construct the perfect world without contradiction, which, is in, which inevitably will lead to inherent contradictions, to antinomies of reason, as Kant himself admits. All the while failing to understand that thinking does not require solutions, but that the mandate of thinking now is to bring together again, to reconcile, the fissure between being and thinking, humans and earth, gods and mortals, from the deep shared memory of the all unifying one, Hen Panta Enai. Thank you very much. <laughs>